Hi. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about gifted learners. Um, you can, you might have noticed in our last lecture we talked a lot about different types of exceptionalities, but we didn't talk about gifted and talented students. So this lecture will cover gifted students. Um, as you might remember, um, gifted and talented education is my area of research focus. So this is one of my favorite lectures to give. I'm really excited about to get to share this learning with you guys and of course at the end of this if you have any questions feel free to send me an email I'd be happy to chat with you about gifted learners so let's talk a little bit about definitions um, a funny thing about our field is that I could ask um, 10 different gifted and talented education um, experts, researchers, what does it mean to be gifted and talented, and I could get 10 completely different definitions. So unlike in special education where the American Psychological Association has really defined each of these areas, um, it is much fuzzier what it means to be gifted. So let's look at a few. The federal definition from the from the um, Javits um, definition um, is a gifted person is someone who gives evidence of high performance capability. So when we say capability, we're really thinking about ability or intelligence, that um, cognitive functioning. Um, but they also have to give evidence of that, which would indicate some sort of achievement, um, some sort of um, score on a test or performance in a classroom that would show evidence of their high performance capability. It could also be performance on an IQ test. Um, the National Association for Gifted Children is the largest organization of parents, teachers, um, researchers, experts in gifted education, um, and they talk about both capability and competence um, in the top percentiles. So capability would be ability, so some type of performance on an intelligence test or an ability test. Um, and then competence would really indicate achievement. So um, top scores on um, FSA tests or on um, in classwork, AP, IB, that kind of work would also indicate um, giftedness. And the idea being that if you're achieving at a high level, you couldn't do that without the ability to do so. And finally, Florida um, really doesn't include the competence section. They just talk about superior intellectual development capable of high performance. So they're really in Florida. Our state definition really only talks about the ability side of things and not the achievement side, which I think might be a detriment to how we can best serve children. Let's talk about some conceptualization. So there's different ways that we could conceptualize or think about gifted learners. Um, and the first one we're going to talk about is um, Francois Gagné. He's one of my favorite researchers. He's this little French Canadian man. And he talked, he has this model called the DMGT, which you can see on the left hand side of your screen, which looks really complicated, but it's really, um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of nuance to it. But in essence, he talks about our natural abilities or our gifts and um, being about the top 10% in different domains, intellectual, um, social, perceptual, physical, creativity, those kinds of things, and that those develop um, into competencies or talents. So gifts develop into talents. Um, and it's, But we only develop those talents um, in the areas in which those gifts are recognized and nurtured. So we're still only talking about a small percentage of the population that um, has the gifts and that are developed into talents, but it requires um, a little bit of chance um, a lot of teacher work, a lot of the students also in their dispositions in order to working towards those goals. Um, then, then Dr. Renzulli talk, has a three ring model. And rather than talking about gifted people per se, he talks about gifted behaviors. And he says that these gifted behaviors um, occur in certain people at certain times under certain circumstances. So the idea is that um, you're not gifted all the time, but you're gifted. We see gifted behaviors when we're put in circumstances where those behaviors are allowed to exhibit. So it's really the onus is on the teacher to create situations in which um, our top students have the ability to, um, to think and grow and develop. And he talks about these behaviors happening when there's a merger of these three rings. 
um, above average ability. And he defines above average ability not in the top 5% or 10%, but um, really the top 15 to 20% of people have this above average ability are capable of gifted behaviors. And that's a much wider breadth than most, um, most gifted definitions. And then he talks about creativity. So this idea of thinking outside the box, coming up with unique and, um, ideas um, and task commitment. So the student has to be engaged and has to um, want to pursue it and, um, and continue to do that. So when a school creates an environment where all of these things, three things merge, then we come up with gifted behaviors. So we can think about how FSA prep worksheets aren't going to create gifted behaviors, but independent projects and studies might. Um, and then a final way to think about um, giftedness is through a developmental model, thinking about asynchronous development. This idea that, our, that in a gifted child that our cognitive and academic development, our intellectual development um, grows faster than our physical or our social development in most cases. So I can have, you think about that three-year-old with an enormous vocabulary, um, but that could create social difficulties because if a three-year-old is using these big words that um, none of the other kids understand, um, that three-year-old might have a hard time making friends and having finding people to relate to them. So this model really thinks about the qualitative differences between um, gifted individuals and other groups. So the next piece to thinking about gifted, once we have a definition, once we kind of know how we've defined it, is how do we identify kids for a gifted program? Um, and it really should depend on the definition. So um, I'm going to identify kids based upon how I have defined giftedness. So if I define giftedness as like in Florida, um, as only um, only based upon ability, then in Florida we only identify based upon IQ test, really. So we have a, a 130 or higher on the WISC as the main determination in Florida of whether or not you're in a gifted program, which is um, really unfortunate, really not what most people in the field would consider to be best practices. Um, so traditionally, um, identification measures could include, um, obviously, IQ tests, but in addition, achievement tests. So um, scoring really highly on the FSAs, um, but even better would be um, tests with a higher ceiling. So um, we have norm-referenced um, achievement tests, so kids who, who have demonstrated that they really have above average um, achievement, so things they've learned in school, not just their ability to learn. Um, there's also standardized creativity tests, which sounds a little backwards, I know, standardized creativity, but really um, these are ways to measure um, how good a child is at generating ideas and thinking of ideas that no one else would think of. Um, we also traditionally rely heavily on teacher and parent recommendations for a program. So when a teacher or a parent recognizes that a child is performing um, at a pace higher than their peers. Um, and we can also use things like portfolios, so collections of student work um, and anecdotes from teachers. Um, but what we found is that these traditional measures um, really um, cause an inequity in the field. So um, we see vast underrepresentation of African American, um, Latino or Latina students, um, traditionally underrepresented populations, um, Native American students um, within our gifted population. And um, there's a lot of reasons why this might be the case. Um, one is those teacher and parent recommendations. So it turns out that teachers are really good at recognizing gifted and talented students of their own ethnicity or race, but it's much more difficult for them to recognize those in other races. And um, that could be due to systemic um, racism. And it could also be um, unrealized. Um, so what we found really, one thing that can really help with um, this underrepresentation policy is rather than asking for recommendations for testing is that if we test every child in a school district, um, even with a very short screener test, we see much greater um, representation of students. So we see a much more diverse field when we can do a simple thing like universal screening. Another way that we can identify more students is rather than basing our identification on national norms, if we base them on school norms. So if we take the top, you know, 5% of students um, in any given school and give them gifted programming, we see a much more diverse field and we see that those kids really blossom and grow at a rate higher than if they had not been identified. 
um, versus if we use national norms, sometimes we might have a school maybe in an area where there's less funding or they've had less educational opportunities and we might see that we have no kids identified in a given school and therefore no one's receiving services. Um, on the other hand, we might be in a school where, you know, as much as 40 to 30 to 40 percent of the kids are identified gifted and at that point um, a lot of those accommodations could be done in the classroom they don't need a special um, a special group for that that the teacher could probably be differentiating within the classroom okay so let's talk a little bit about what it means to be gifted we're thinking some characteristics of gifted learners um, the first thing one huge myth is that gifted learners um, have more psychological problems than a typical population. I really just want to say that there's no evidence of that, that really when we look at um, depression, anxiety, um, psychosis, and we don't see more or less in a gifted population. So it really doesn't have um, a variability by intelligence. However, the ways in which it manifests, there could be some slight differences. For example, um, gifted kids who are in extremely academically rigorous programs um, may experience more anxiety related to school um, and feel more pressure due to their gifts. Um, perfectionism, when a student is um, capable of doing really um, extraordinarily good work without a lot of mistakes early on, they might develop an idea that perfect, perfection is what the norm should be. And that level of perfectionism um, can create anxiety and, and lead to psychological problems. We also see problems related to underachievement. So gifted students with a lot of potential, they don't live up to that potential. Um, however, giftedness can also be a resilience factor. So I might be able to be more self-reflective and better able to understand my psychological problems because of my giftedness and then therefore be better able to cope with them. Um, twice exceptionality is another um, another category of giftedness that I really want to address here. I want all of you to understand that a child could be identified as gifted and also one of those other categories that was listed under IDEA. So I can be gifted and have ADHD. I can be gifted and be on the autism spectrum. I can be gifted and even have a learning disability. So we see lots of examples of extremely gifted children who also have dyslexia. So, and what can happen, three, three things can really happen with um, students who are twice exceptional before things. So the first one is um, that they're identified for both, that, they, that they're gifted and their special needs are both identified and they get services for both and the world is a very happy place. Um, another thing that can happen is that they're identified as gifted and their special need is never identified. Um, so that because their giftedness masks it. So they never really live up to their potential and they really struggle throughout school because no one no one ever identifies their special need. Um, and this is actually really common. In fact, um, we see it a lot, like let's say a, a student with um, ADHD and attentive type, right? They might just be seen as lazy um, and um, not listening to the teacher, um, and yet their giftedness kind of allows them to make up the work and piece together what they weren't paying attention to because they're so smart that no one ever realizes that they have an actual um, disability when it comes to attending to things. And the other thing that could happen is that their special need gets identified and no one ever really recognizes their gifts. So they might be placed in special education programs um, and because of their disability, no one ever realizes their true potential um, in their giftedness. Um, and then finally, and maybe the most tragic, is when a kid isn't identified for either, so that their gifts mask their special needs and their special needs mask their gifts and they never really get the support they need in either area and they just kind of fall through the cracks. So it's really important as a teacher that you recognize that this can happen and that when you see a kid who is gifted and isn't performing the level you think they might be capable of, that you just rule out um, as a stability, even if they're performing at grade level or even if they're not failing yet, their gifts might be able, their intelligence might be able to keep, prevent them from failing, but never really let them reach their full potential. Um, and so some finally some, some characteristics that we kind of see and get the gifted population, of course, not universally, and these vary quite a bit between children. Um, and not every gifted kid, of course, would, rec would have these characteristics. But when you see a kid with these, um, you might think hmm, maybe there's something else going on here. 
so advanced work, finishing work quickly, um, quickly and, and, and kind of correctly, right? Um, that can be an example of, of a kid classically who would identify for a gifted program. Um, kids with really large vocabularies, especially at a young age. Um, kids with advanced senses of humor, so our really clever kids, sometimes those class clowns that um, drive you crazy as a teacher might actually be your gifted one. Um, kids who tend to have older friends or adult friends hang out with the adults more than the kids, sometimes that's in the sign of giftedness because they're trying to find some intellectual peers. Um, and kids who are really creative, um, kids who even outside of school or in other projects um, may be um, are always creating things, making things. Um, that's another example of, of giftedness, perhaps, and something you might be looking out for. But again, it's really hard to come up with a list of characteristics. Like it starts to read like a horoscope, and you can find anything in there because it's really a diverse group of students. So let's talk a little bit about program options and things you can do as a teacher for your gifted learners. So the first major category of, of interventions for gifted learners are acceleration. And um, this is the most widely researched and widely researched supported way to meet the gifted learners' needs. So we have lots and lots of evidence over a long period of time showing that acceleration works both socially and academically. So when kids are accelerated, they do better intellectually and academically, which makes sense because they're getting advanced content. Um, but a lot of times we worry about the social implications of acceleration. And what we find is that kids either do better or they're not worse off than if they hadn't been accelerated. So kids who already struggle socially um, don't do worse when they are accelerated. Of course, acceleration would have to be an individual decision. And the kids that tend to, um, who struggle the most with acceleration are kids who have a really strong social foundation in the group that they're currently in and do not want to be accelerated. So and those are some considerations. So the first way that we, the first thing that we think of when we think of acceleration is grade skipping. So, you know, skipping second grade and moving straight from first grade to third grade. Um, sometimes that might be multiple grade skipping, so moving from first grade to fourth or fifth grade um, is another way that that could work. And we also do single subject areas acceleration. So that would be like taking, um, instead of taking um, algebra in ninth grade, taking it in seventh or eighth grade would be an example of subject area acceleration. So moving ahead in one subject, but not in all subject areas. Um, another way that we accelerate kids is is entering kindergarten early, so maybe starting kindergarten at age four instead of age five. Um, or the same thing with first grade, so it might be skipping kindergarten. Um, the, one of the most common ways that we accelerate, and this is really widely accepted um, in our school systems now, are things like advanced placement, international baccalaureate, the um, Cambridge um, ACE program, and dual enrollment in high school. These are all ways in which high school students are earning college credit while they're still in high school. And these are examples of acceleration because they're getting college level content in the high school. So we would consider that acceleration. And again, we have a lot of evidence that shows that that's a really beneficial for students. And finally, we have acceleration within the classroom or with a whole class. So for example, if I am teaching an advanced set of second graders, and instead of reading a second grade level textbook or a second grade level book in our reading circles, we're reading a fourth or fifth grade level book, that would be acceleration within the class. We're studying or reading material that is meant for an older grade level within a class. And really what we find is that when we can accelerate a whole group of students together, like we have a whole classroom, of seventh graders taking algebra, we see a lot of um, really strong benefits for that because we are eliminating a lot of the social implications of acceleration because we have that social group already built in. Um, another another um, set of program options for gifted kids are enrichment programs. So rather than going more quickly through the curriculum, we're going in more depth. So that's our classic pull-out program in the elementary schools where kids are removed from their regular classroom for a day or part of a day during the school, and they are put in a gifted program. And typically in that program, they're doing some sort of extra things or enriching things. So it could be things like creative problem solving and um, studying something different from the rest of the class in more depth. 
Um, it could be doing independent studies. Um, sometimes they're called power hour or genius hour where kids are learning about a passion project, something that they're really interested in and studying on their own in more depth. Um, also programs where kids are doing rote coding or robotics or invention convention or science fair that's not part of the regular classroom. All of those are really enrichment. Kids are studying something um, in more depth or something that's not part of the regular curriculum and um, adding to it, enriching it. Um, one thing to think about with enrichment is that a lot of these enrichment programs would be good for all kids or not just gifted kids. So robot, a robotics program at a school might be targeted towards gifted kids, but if other kids would benefit from it, there's no reason why a larger range of kids couldn't participate in the robotics program and really benefit from it. So we don't want to be exclusionary in gifted programs when it would benefit um, more children. Um, and finally, um, there's differentiation. And this is something that as a teacher, you're probably going to have to do because you're going to have a gifted kid um, in your classroom at some point, right? And within your classroom, you're going to have to think about um, how am I going to help and adapt my classroom to meet their needs? Um, and we oftentimes think about differentiation for our special needs students and making sure that we're adapting for English language learners and making sure that they have access to the material. We also want to think about differentiating up and making sure that we have um, support and um, work um, and lessons that are appropriate for our gifted learners. So um, that concludes everything about gifted learners that I could fit into um, right about 20 minutes. But again, there's so much more to learn about giftedness and gifted education. So if you ever have any questions or want more resources, please reach out to me. I'd be happy, more than happy to discuss it with you. Um, and have a great day. Bye.